tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the show. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast, bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. Well, hello there, listeners. I see you found your way back to Horror Hill. How deliciously fortuitous. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and since you're here, why don't you sit down for a bit and let me tell you some scary stories. After all, it's not like you're going anywhere. Not with those rotting hands sprouting from the ground and grabbing your ankles. Our evening begins with Dinner Date by Bikram Mann. Life can be difficult when you're a homicide detective. The hours are long and erratic. Your days are filled talking to people experiencing horrific grief, and you frequently run afoul of murderers. Tonight, our protagonist is able to take some time off from the job to have a fancy dinner with his wife. However, there are terrors beyond those of the physical world, and sometimes, certain people can learn to harness them. After that, we'll be diving into Ruckus by William Stewart. This story opens with a situation so sweet that it's almost saccharine. A father gushing over his daughter's burgeoning artistic ability. Young Ally is quite the artist and has won several prizes at local art contests. However, her most recent prize is a bit of an enigma, since Ali can't recall which contest it's from. After that, things start to change in this charming little domestic scene, and neither Ali nor her parents will ever be the same. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to help support Horror Hill and also remove these pesky ads, Head over to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. You'll get instant access to hundreds of ad-free stories, and we can scale back some of our uh, less savory means of generating money for the show. By the way, you don't happen to still have all of your organs, do you? And now, from author Bikram Mann, I give you Dinner Date.
she is still the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Brown eyes shaded with the amber haze of a perfect autumn. Full red lips that curl in mischief. Thick, wavy blonde hair that teases her bare shoulders. She burns so bright it makes my eyes water. Yet I cannot look away, dare not look away, lest this moment passes before I've had my fill. After all, such opportunities don't come often these days where we get to be together. Just the two of us, alone. These moments are precious, priceless. And here she walks towards me, the rhythmic clicking of her heels on the linoleum floor, the hypnotic sway of her hips, and her tight red dress reminding me of the time I asked her to marry me in this very restaurant. That evening, we met at the park half a mile to the east of this place, strolled up to the ridge overlooking the marble fountain, sat on the cracked stone bench, and talked. Talked until the smoky sky streaked with the embers of the setting sun turned into a black blanket studded with small diamonds. Talked until my heart swelled in my chest, threatened to tear itself free of the bone that held it in place. We wrapped our arms around each other's waists as we walked to the restaurant, our eyes full of love and hope and dreams and things that made life worth living. I remember the look on her face when I went down on one knee that night, how her eyes sparkled with tears and the glimmer of light reflected off the diamond, how she cupped one hand on her mouth, slowly extended the other one towards me, how she threw herself into my arms and sobbed into my chest after I slipped the ring onto her finger. My spine tingled with ecstasy. I felt like I was on top of the world, invincible. What are you thinking about, handsome? She asks, pulling me out of my reverie. You, I answer. What else could it be? She smiles and glides into the seat opposite mine. The flames of the black candelabrum on the table flicker as she tosses her purse to the side, brushes a loose strand of hair behind her ear. I hope I didn't make you wait too long. Work was just a bitch. I shake my head. No, you arrived exactly when I thought you would. She makes an expression of faux shock. What's that supposed to mean? I'll have you know I'm a very punctual woman. Oh, of course you are. Who would dare doubt that? You're lucky you're cute, mister. Well, a man's gotta have at least one redeeming quality, right? She chuckles, then leans forward and rests her chin on the palm of her hand. The act makes my heart beat faster. Careful now, that's my husband you're talking about. Apologies, my lady. I bow my head in an exaggerated manner. I did not mean to insult the good gentleman. Ah, fine. I'll let you off this one time. We both look at each other and laugh. It's not loud and boisterous, but muted. A laughter that's born from the comfort of years of companionship. This is nice, she says. We should do this more often. We really should. If only you weren't so busy all the time. I won't be, I reply. Not anymore. She raises an eyebrow. What do you mean? I flash her a broad smile. Like I said, I won't be so busy anymore. At least, not in the foreseeable future. Wait, don't tell me. Did you solve the case? I nod my head. What? Her eyes widen in excitement. No way! You caught the guy? Yep. The murderer? Yep the most infamous serial killer in the tri-state area. Yeah. Get out of here. I laugh. I'm not joking. We really did solve the case. Really? How come I haven't heard about it on the news? She asks. Oh, you are definitely not going to hear about it on the news. She looks at me with suspicion. What are you talking about? It's just, you know, the case isn't fit for the media. Not anymore. She groans. God, you're killing me. Just tell me how you found out who the killer was. I grinned. 
This was one of the biggest reasons why we got together in the first place. Not everyone is cut out to be married to someone in my profession. The job can get taxing. Long hours, little to no rewards, the constant threat to life, the stress that comes with dealing with the absolute scum of society. Certainly not easy to find someone who'd be willing to put up with all that, but I did, and she didn't just tolerate it, she loved it. In the early days of our courtship, we spent far more time discussing my cases than the usual superficial shit that most other couples talk about. I knew I had found a keeper when she attentively listened to me rambling about paperwork. Okay, I say. I'll tell you, but I'm warning you. This is going to sound crazy. Now you've really got my interest. Right. I straighten my back. You know what the key to the whole thing was? No. What was it? This restaurant, I say, pointing my finger at the floor. What? She whispered. Holy shit. Yes. Believe me, I was as shocked as you are now, but it's true. This place was the only thing tying the victims together. There was little else. Hell, even the methods used were sometimes so different that it took a long time to identify the murders as the serial killings that they were. I mean, there was this woman who was tied to her armchair and burned alive. That middle-aged man, Schillinger, who had his head smashed in with a brick. And that college student whose face was jammed into a lawnmower. All strange murders with no witnesses, no fingerprints, and no suspects with discernible motives. It wasn't until we found three bodies in three different towns that it got really serious. Right, she says. The three hanging corpses, the ones with bruises all over their bodies. Yes, I say. They were the ones who helped turn the tide for the investigation. From seemingly disconnected killings spread across multiple cities, the case became about the most prolific serial killer in this part of the country. But even then, tying those murders with the other ones was still an incredibly difficult task. It was all conjecture at that point. The connections were wafer thin. Yeah, sure, it was odd to find a battered corpse hanging from the ceiling fan inside a room locked from the inside, but that didn't necessarily mean that it was just like the charred corpse found in another locked room, right? For all we knew, the latter could have just been a suicide. No. We needed stronger evidence. And it was this restaurant, she says, and I see her shiver. It was a complete accident that I found out about it. As you know, I've been working late nights, just poring over the documents, trying to make sense of this stupefying case. Hours would go by and it would be midnight before I noticed it. I would get so engrossed that I'd even forget to eat. Whenever that happened, I would usually go out and grab a sandwich or something instead of coming back home and creating a ruckus in the kitchen while you were trying to sleep. Sometimes I'd come here, despite how expensive it can be compared to my other options. I don't know, it just reminds me of happier times, I guess. And it was on one of those nights that I found that one piece of evidence that cracked this case wide open. What was it? She asks her unblinking eyes fully focused on me. I shake my head in wonder. You wouldn't believe it if I told you. It was right fucking there, staring me in the face, and I missed it. But not that night, thank God. It had been raining. I was drenched, exhausted, hungry, and with a pounding headache to boot. Just wanted to quickly fill my belly and go back home. I gave the waiter my usual order, sighed, and leaned back in my chair. That one, over there. She turns her neck and looks at the spot I'm pointing at. So I craned my neck, I continue, and looked at the wall in front of me. And that's where I saw it. Framed fucking pictures of two of the victims hanging on the wall. No, don't look there. They took them down, obviously. She turns back around sharply. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My first instinct was to believe that I was hallucinating, that my obsession and exhaustion had formed a heady little cocktail that was messing with my mind. 
So I pinched myself, rubbed my eyes, and all that jazz. But they were still there. Samantha Hoffman, the 29-year-old waitress whose body was cut into 11 pieces that were found strewn across her living room floor by her husband after he came back from a work trip. They lived 67 miles away. What the fuck was her picture doing here? And Daniel Iverson, one of the hanging corpses from our city. His photograph was up on the wall too. Oh my, so what did you do? She asks. I grabbed the manager and told him that I needed to know about those pictures. He tells me that he doesn't really know who they were, that it's a tradition of the restaurant to take pictures of their customers, with their consent of course, and put them up on the wall. They change them every six months or so. Good business practice, he says. Shows people having fun here. Let's other customers know that this restaurant's food, its vibe, its quality of service are all top notch. And that's how I eventually found out that all the victims had visited this restaurant sometime before their deaths. Holy shit! She rubs her arms. The killer was connected to this place. An employee of the restaurant or a regular customer or something. That's exactly what I thought, I admitted. After we'd checked the security footage and confirmed that at least four more victims had visited this place, we guessed that the killer was using this restaurant as his hunting ground. So we went about checking up on everyone who visited this place regularly. Waiters, cooks, the manager, the janitorial staff, the private night security, frequent customers, all of them. But not one suspect fit the bill. Sure, there were suspicious characters, but nothing that could help us pin down the killer. Strong alibis made our job that much harder. I was getting increasingly frustrated. It seemed like I was so close, so fucking close, but the answer was just out of my reach. The media was breathing down our necks and I was losing my fucking mind. I even started taking my anger out on you and the distance between us just grew more and more. My guilt only made me angrier, a self-fulfilling loop of rage. She winces. Yeah, I wasn't an angel either. I really should have been more understanding. It was the owner of this restaurant, Desmond Miller, who gave me that last breakthrough I needed in this case. I had been too persistent to the point that it was bordering on harassment of his employees, so he figured he'd give up and tell me what all this sordid mess was really about. He invited me over to his office one evening, sat me down, offered me one of his cigars, and told me about the murder of one of his ancestors and how it was tied to the case that I was working on. Wow, ancestors? Yeah, I reply, and we haven't even gotten to the crazy part yet. So Desmond tells me that about 150 years ago, his great-great-grandfather or something built a manor on this very land that the restaurant currently stands on and started living there with his wife. They had no children, a fact that was greatly resented by the master of the house. He needed an heir, a good strong son, and his wife, who just so happened to be barren, was incapable of giving him that. So he planned to cast her out and have sons with another, much younger woman. His wife found out what he was planning on doing, saw that he was going to leave her broken-hearted and penniless, so she killed herself before he could put her through all that dishonor. She blinks. What exactly does that have to do with this case? I'm getting to that, I say. Desmond said that as the woman threw herself off the balcony, she cursed her husband with all of her strength, screamed that she wished he and everyone like him, all the backstabbing pieces of shit in the world, would burn in hell for all eternity. Desmond said that as the story goes, the power of her curse shook the heavens. Thunder cracked the sky open. Lightning struck the house and set it ablaze and all that good stuff. He told me that it's her. She's the killer that I had been pursuing. Every couple of decades or so, she enters our world and starts murdering those deserving of her wrath and enslaves their souls binds them to herself and to her land, only letting them out once a year. 
adulterers, cheaters, those who are unfaithful to their spouses or partners. She kills them all. She gawks at me. Are you fucking with me right now? You are, aren't you? There's no way you expect me to believe some ghost story. I throw my hands up. That was exactly my reaction. Worse, even. I wanted to beat that asshole up. Thought that he was making fun of me for being utterly ineffective at my job. I guess he saw the rage on my face because he told me I didn't have to believe him. I could test the theory out myself. Test it out? She asks. Beads of sweat begin to bud on her forehead. She squirms in her seat like she's trying to work out a knot in the padding. Yeah, test it out, I answer. See, the way this curse is supposed to work is that if she's active in our world, all you have to do is step on her property and you'll be marked. If you've betrayed your lover, that is. No matter where you go afterwards, no matter how far you run from this place, she'll find you and kill you in the most horrific manner possible. There's no stopping her. No rituals or exorcisms work. Desmond says that they tried all that in the past. Nothing worked. All you can do, really, is wait out the storm. Besides not cheating in the first place, of course. She doesn't say anything just chews her lip and clenches her fists on the table. Her beautiful brown eyes dart around like those of a cornered rat. So all I have to do is bring a cheater out here and see for myself whether the curse is real or not. Enough, she growls. This isn't funny, you know. I, I know what you're doing. You think I'm cheating on you, don't you? This, she waves her arm around wildly, is all just a game to get me to confess, isn't it? Well, asshole, it's not going to work, because there's nothing to confess. I let out an exhausted sigh, lean back in my chair, and run my fingers through my hair. There she goes, trying to regain control again. Shit just never changes. I don't want your confession. I already know. She waits for me to continue. I can see her closed fists shaking in anger and fear. I stare at her. My eyes harden. Really? My brother? My fucking brother? She gasps. Her eyes drift over my face. The realization dawns on her. I know. I really know. Tears spring forth, right on cue. Oh, honey, it's not what... Not what I think. It didn't really mean anything. You love me and never wanted to hurt me. Are you sure that's what you should be thinking about right now? She stares at me, unsure of what I'm getting at. I tap my watch. Tick tock. The clock is ticking, darling. Cordelia Miller's coming for you. She jumps out of her chair. You were joking about that, weren't you? A sob escapes from her chest when she sees that I'm refusing to reply. I'm sorry, I... I have to go, she cries before she rushes towards the front door, stumbling along the way. She's almost at the door. No, not yet. Can't just let it end like this. Oh, one more thing before you leave, I yell just as she's about to leave. She stops, turns around. Her knees are trembling, mascara running down the side of her face. Shit, it really doesn't change. It's almost not fun anymore. What? She asks, her voice cracked. No, broken. Don't bother running. It's already too late. Cordelia's already won. What do you mean? She asks, wiping the tears off her face. I rub my eyes. Honey, what year do you think this is? Huh? Humor me. Just answer my question. 2009? I smile. Behind me, a rat skitters across the cracked, 
dust-riddled marble of what once used to be the reception desk. You've been listening to Dinner Date by Bikram Mann. And now, to close out our evening, I give you Ruckus by William Stewart. I'd just gotten home from work and was digging in the pantry for a snack when my wife, Julie, came in and handed me a pink backpack. You should see what your daughter did to her math test, she said, half laughing. I sat down and emptied the pack onto the table. An uneaten half of a sandwich fell out among various folders. I found the one marked Homework and opened it and had to suppress a giggle. The folder and everything in it had been completely covered in doodles. Mermaids of all colors swam in the margins. Elves with pointed ears stood with short swords and bows at the ready. Allie's imagination knew no bounds. I flipped to the graded page with teacher feedback scribbled in red ink at the top. 87%, good job. I scanned the paper, looking for what she'd gotten wrong among the doodles. Then, the entire sheet came into focus and I sat in quiet awe of my ten-year-old's artistic talents. She had drawn a dragon around the missed questions. The creature's body snaked about the other problems, each of which had been decorated to look like parts of a castle. Knights, elves, and fairies fought the dragon between the lines. The dragon itself was so finely detailed that in some spots it actually seemed to glisten. She'd drawn and shaded every scale. The beast was wounded and blood trickled from injuries all along its neck and torso. Dead warriors were scattered across the page, little figures lying in pools of blood, lost or discarded weapons covering every square millimeter of available space. It was, in short, a masterpiece, an epic battle between man and monster. The faces on the little warriors showed grim determination that seemed to mask… fear? Was that right? Was she really that detailed, or was I just reading way too much into this? I mean, her art was amazing. It had been since she was old enough to hold a crayon. But did a bunch of doodles on a leftover homework sheet really command such reverence? I didn't want to think so. Still, I couldn't look away. It was magnificent. I regretted that the canvas was covered in math problems. This was one I'd be happy to keep, were it not for the fact that every square inch of available wall space in my office was already dedicated to my daughter's drawings. Still, this dragon was unreal. Since she had been a toddler, Allie had loved fantastic beasts and far-off worlds of adventure and romance. It wasn't surprising that she loved unicorns, Disney princesses, and the like. Most girls her age enjoyed those things. What was a bit unusual was that she also enjoyed the darker stuff. Dragons and trolls were some of her favorite things to draw, and when her elementary school classes lost her attention, she'd dutifully sketch row after row of soldiers, each one complete with armor and weapons. Elvish armies seemed to be her favorite, and she had dozens of pages of little elves squinting under helmets while their elongated ears poked out in different directions, often with comical effect. Allie came in a few minutes later, and I handed her the paper. B+, plus? not bad. She looked at it and then set it on the table. Would have been an A, but you needed the answer to question 12 to solve question 13, And I got twelve wrong, so... She rolled her eyes. So you set a dragon on them? Dragons are good for solving problems, Dad. Ask any dragon what's the reciprocal, and he won't even think about it. He'll just burn you to ash. Reciprocals are stupid. Dragons know this. I couldn't help but laugh as Allie shook her head in mock frustration, before asking, Did we get any mail? I don't know, but I know how you could find out, Julie said. Allie got the hint and headed toward the front door. 
That's another thing dragons have no patience for. Late mail. Be late once, maybe get an arm or leg bitten off as a warning. Do it again. Ali made a sound in her throat and waved her arm to indicate that she was burning everything around her. As funny as it was, I glanced over to the little elvish army men on her math test. Those poor fellows. I secretly hoped they never did anything to incur the wrath of Ali or her dragons. One soldier in particular had a grim look on his face. I picked up the paper and looked closer. Don't worry, man. Just don't talk about reciprocals and you should be just fine. Are you seriously talking to homework? Julie asked. I held the page and looked from it to her before saying, Well, you heard her, didn't you? These guys are cute. Don't want her sicking her dragons on them or anything. Julie laughed. You're just as bad as she is. So, how are the contest entries going? I asked after Allie had come back in and the three of us had sat down for dinner. Last year, when Allie was nine, Julie had entered two of her drawings into a local contest and she'd won first prize. As if that weren't enough, the children's hospital bought both pictures at auction for $100 apiece. The look on her face when she'd held that blue ribbon and that check was priceless. Julie, after that, she was hooked. If there was an art contest of any kind, Allie would enter it. Sometimes she'd enter several drawings per contest, just to increase her odds. And because she really was good, and this isn't just proud dad talk, she won quite a few. Most often, the prize was a gift card to an art store or hobby shop. Allie's dresser drawers were packed with sketchbooks, pencils, markers, and other art supplies she'd either won or bought with prize money. And at least a couple times a week, she'd either send out an envelope full of new submissions, or one would arrive announcing whether she'd won anything. It wasn't uncommon for nearly all the mail to be for her. That day was no different, and as we sat around the table to eat, the doorbell rang. Allie hopped up and ran to the door, returning a moment later with a package. She tore it open and dumped the contents next to her plate. Out of the bubble wrap came a hardback book and a box of pencils. I could tell at first glance that this was some high-quality stuff. The pencil box was made of wood and had a little silver clasp holding it closed. The book was leather-bound and gilded in silver. It was beautiful. She searched the envelope for a letter to tell her which contest she had won or where it had come from, but other than the box and the book, the package was empty. The only communication was a note on the first page of the book. Written in exquisite calligraphy, it said, For Alison Denning, if all of your heart and soul do you give, more than mere drawings, the things you dream live. Cool, Allie said. She set the book aside and opened the pencil box. These seemed to be almost handcrafted. They weren't perfectly straight, and the lead points differed in length and thickness. Allie took one and grabbed a piece of notebook paper from her backpack. She made lines with each of the pencils before exclaiming, They've all got different hardness, for shading and fine lines and everything. It's a master's kit. She gulped down her dinner and then ran to her room to try out her new stuff. I leaned back in my chair and smiled at my wife. She really is amazing, isn't she? It was the last time any of us would smile. That night was my turn to tuck Allie in at bedtime. After baths and brushed teeth and a round of hugs and kisses, I followed her into her room and sat on the edge of her bed. So how do you like the new pencils? They're awesome, she yawned. Really easy. Can I take a look? Sure. I picked up the book from her nightstand, opened it, and nearly jumped out of my skin. On the page was the nastiest creature I had ever seen. A squat, muscular body sat on short, powerful legs. Its arms were thick, with huge hands that terminated with curved, cruel-looking claws. Its face was even worse. 
Small, beady eyes were shadowed by an exaggerated brow with tiny, pointed ears stuck out from the side of its misshapen head. A short snout snarled around rows of long, pointed teeth. Saliva hung in thick ropes from its bottom jaw. But despite being disgusting, the figure was rendered with a master's skill and talent. The shading on the eyes and skin gave it a three-dimensional effect that made it practically jump off the page. Allie, I said. She leaned in to have a look. Oh, that's just ruckus, she said. He lives in the woods and eats the children that get lost there. She stretched and yawned again. Good night, Daddy. I closed the book and hugged and kissed her again, turning her light out as I left the room. I looked back over my shoulder, disturbed by the way her nightlight cast shadows on the wall. Good night, my love. Sweet dreams. Hours later, we were awakened by a scream. I threw on my shorts and ran down the hall to Allie's room. Her lamp was on and she was sitting up in her bed, panting and trembling with fear. It's in the closet, Dad, she said, pointing. What's in the closet? I asked, rubbing sleep from my eyes. I don't know. Something. I heard a noise, and when I looked, it ran into the closet. The closet door was closed. Had it been open before? I couldn't remember. I reached for the knob, then hesitated. It was most likely that she'd been dreaming, but there was always the chance that she'd seen a rat or a mouse. Our neighborhood was somewhat rural, so vermin were a common problem. I went to the kitchen and grabbed a broom, just in case. Julie had come in by now and was sitting with Allie on the bed, smoothing her hair and trying to calm her down. I opened the door and pulled the chain for the light and prepared to bash a pest, but there was nothing there. I used the broomstick to scatter a pile of dirty clothes, but there was nothing. If something had been in there, it was gone. I walked over to sit on the bed with my wife and daughter. Noticing that the sketchbook had fallen from the nightstand, I closed it as I picked it up, not wanting to sneak another glance at the disgusting ruckus. After a few more minutes of convincing her she'd only been dreaming, we finally said goodnight to Allie and went back to bed. The next day was Saturday, so there was no work or school. Julie and I sat on the sofa playing on our phones when Allie came in, puffy-eyed with her new sketchbook tucked under her arm. Dad, did you tear out my picture? She asked, a strange look on her tired face. What picture? I asked. That was me, Julie offered. You spent your whole night drawing that nasty little thing and it gave you nightmares. You should draw something pretty, Allie, especially at night. Allie rolled her eyes and whined, Mom, don't do that. Ruckus is a part of my story and I need him. Fine, Julie countered. Just watch what kind of scary monsters you work on right before bed. You kept us up all night. Yes, Mom. Allie sulked as she made her way to the table and got out her supplies. Julie and I continued to play on our phones for a while before she stood up and asked if anyone wanted breakfast. My stomach grumbled at the notion, and I raised my hand. Allie didn't respond, just kept scritch, scritch, scritching on her sheet. Julie shrugged and went into the kitchen. Honey, she called. I had gotten up to go see what it was Allie was working on, hoping it wasn't a replacement ruckus, but knowing that it was... Yeah? Where's the chef's knife? Hmm? I asked, not really hearing her as I went to stand over Allie's shoulder. For the second time in less than a day, my blood went cold. There was another picture of Ruckus, eater of children. Only this version was impossibly well detailed. And while Allie was skilled, she was still only ten after all. This one was almost photorealistic. This was impossible. Even someone with the advanced skills necessary to draw this would have taken many hours over the span of days, 
Not however long it took to drink two cups of coffee. Worse, it dawned on me as I looked closer. Ruckus was in color, although Ali was only using black pencils. And there was something else. The first Ruckus had been naked, of that I was sure. His gnarled skin had seemed to shine from the way it had been shaded. This Ruckus wore a pink... Gorman Elementary Wildcats t-shirt that had been torn and stretched to look like a tunic. Worse, in his hand he held a butcher knife. Allie, why did you draw that? How? My words were cut off by a scream and crash from the kitchen. I scrambled through the living room and turned the corner to see the impossible. Julie, my wife, my best friend, sat on the floor, her hand pressed to a gash in her throat. She tried to stem the flow of blood, but it poured between her fingers as her wide eyes twitched in their sockets, eyes that finally landed on me in a final, shocked plea for help. I stood, transfixed, paralyzed in my pajama shorts and World's Greatest Dad t-shirt. I couldn't process what I had just seen. Then, a searing pain ripped through the back of my knee and I fell screaming into the pool of my wife's blood. I rolled over to see Ruckus, the original black and white monster from the night before, standing over me, holding our kitchen knife. He was bigger than the picture, but all the details, especially the razor teeth and claws, were the same. He made a sort of hissing sound as he rounded on me, lifting the knife to take another blow. I raised my arm weakly to try to block as he brought the knife down. Pain exploded in my forearm as the blade slid between the bones. Blood sprayed onto my face and I had the odd sensation of being dragged as the impossible beast tugged at the knife, trying to pull it free. Don't you hurt my daddy! Allie screamed, having finally broken out of her trance. Ruckus stopped tugging at the knife and turned around. Allie held the crumpled sheet of paper that Julie had torn from the book and thrown away. Ruckus froze and put his hands up, willing her to stop whatever she was about to do. Allie looked at the beast with hatred in her eyes, then tore the page in half. Ruckus screamed as his left side came apart from his right. The two halves writhed on the floor as Allie laid the pieces of paper together and tore them in half again, and then again. With each rend, the creature screamed louder and separated into more parts. But he did not stop, and he didn't go away. Allie began to panic, the sights and sounds finally catching up with her. Allie! I gasped. The fire! Allie looked to the side and noticed the blue gas flames on the stove Julie had lit just a few moments before. She shoved the pieces into the fire and Ruckus's screaming intensified as his parts slowly turned to ash. I slipped through the pool of blood, trying to stand up, to do anything, but I couldn't. The last thing I remember before everything went black was seeing Allie picking up the phone to dial 911 and my horror as the new ruckus walked into the kitchen behind her. I woke up in a hospital bed two days later. The doctors informed me that I'd barely survived. The wound in my leg was so severe they'd had to amputate at the knee. They'd saved my arm, but there was nerve damage and it would be a long road to recovery for even partial use of my hand. The police were next. They informed me that Julie was dead and that Allie was missing. I was not, in fact, a suspect, and they were searching for our attackers as we spoke. The reason they knew I wasn't a suspect was that there had been other similar cases since I'd been in the hospital. They asked if I could offer any information on why someone would want to attack us or why someone would want to take Allie. I thought about telling them to look for someone dropping strange packages at random doors, but I knew it was no use. 
Now that they have Ali, whoever, whatever they are, they don't need to continue their search. They found the one they needed because she's good enough to bring them to life. I don't know where my daughter is or why things had to happen the way that they did, but I do know they have her somewhere and that they're using her talent to summon truly evil things. Since I've been in the hospital, there are more and more people who report strange and fantastic creatures with incredible powers and a penchant for extreme violence. The one they see the most often is a squat, muscular creature with a short snout and razor-sharp teeth. The news and web articles call it the Dog Man or the Pig Man, but his name is Ruckus. He lives in the forest and preys on the children who get lost there. But he also preys on the children who aren't lost, and he preys on their parents too. You've been listening to Ruckus by William Stewart. William Stewart lives in Houston with his wife, kids, and an old grumpy dog. When he's not writing scary stories, you can find him taking naps on the couch, collecting vintage Halloween stuff, and hanging out in the garage, trying to make dead things come back to life. And on that note, listeners, we conclude our broadcast evening. I'd like to mention that both of tonight's authors, Bikram Mann and William Stewart, have collections of their work available through Velux Books, www.veloxbooks.com. I'd encourage you to head over there and grab yourself a copy, as well as to peruse their numerous other offerings. As we get further into Halloween season, you might notice your hunger for horror increasing a bit. If you need more terrifying content than I can provide, I'd recommend checking out the other shows under the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights umbrella, such as Otis Geary's Scary Stories Told in the Dark, Drew Blood's Dark Tales, and Paul J. McSorley's Fear from the Heartland. And rest assured, there will always be a new episode of Horror Hill every week. Until next time, listeners, stay spooky. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Tonight's episode was hosted and narrated by yours truly, Eric Peabody. Original music provided by Eric Peabody and Nikki McSorley. Finalization by N.M. Brown and S.K. Brown. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? Email it to us at natalie at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your work considered for future production. Seeing as how we're all living in a technological nightmare of our own devising, I'll ask you to follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on social media and upvote, subscribe, and hit the bell notification icon if you're listening to this on YouTube. Not only will you have appeased the dark gods of cyberspace, but you'll be kept in the loop as we prepare more terrifying content. If you'd like access to uninterrupted horror, free of ads, and these annoying bookend segments, might I recommend signing up for our Patreon? You'll get access to hundreds of episodes of this show, as well as everything else from the other programs in the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights cabal. That means all of Otis Cheery's Scary Stories Told in the Dark, Drew Blood's Dark Tales, Paul J. McSorley's Fear from the Heartland, and more. It's a veritable smorgasbord of horrific delights. As for me personally, I'm on most social media sites as Viking Guitar or Viking Guitar Productions. I'm always on the lookout for new stories to narrate and new music projects to mix or master. If that's of interest to you, feel free to reach out and we can talk turkey. Also, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. 
Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.